This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 64. Coming up on Space Time, the Parker Solar Probe launches on its mission to touch the Sun, a mysterious monster from the early universe, and the stellar close encounter which may have shaped our solar system. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA's Parker Solar Probe has successfully blasted into space on an historic mission to touch the sun. The spacecraft pierced the velvet black early morning skies on a golden ribbon of flames as its United Launch Alliance Delta IV rocket blasted off from Space Launch Complex 37 at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2... One, zero. Liftoff of the mighty Delta IV heavy rocket with NASA's Parker Solar Probe. A daring mission to shed light on the mysteries of our closest star, the sun. Two pressures continue to look good on all three boosters. Now 35 seconds in. Take a pressure on the core booster. It's uh, throttling down to the partial thrust mode. Response looks good. Strap on boosters look good in the full thrust mode. Core booster looks good in the uh, partial thrust mode. Equal trajectory looking good right down the middle of the range track. Max Q, maximum dynamic pressure, and Mach 1 Delta IV is now supersonic. Port and starboard booster engines continue to look good in the full thrust mode. Core booster looks good in the partial thrust mode. Trajectory continuing to look good right down the middle of the range track. ACS press valve has been opened. ACS pressure response looks good. Strap on boosters continue to look good in the full thrust mode. Core booster looks good in the partial thrust mode. And Delta IV has gone to closed loop guidance. And at 2 minutes 39 seconds into flight, the Delta IV rocket now weighs just one half of what it did at launch, burning propellant at a rate of almost 5,000 pounds per second. And launch vehicle is now 33 miles in altitude, 49 miles downrange distance, traveling at 4,500 miles per hour. Three minutes into flight. RS-68A engines in the port and starboard boosters continue to look good in the full thrust mode. Core booster looks good in the partial thrust mode. Trajectory continuing to look good down the middle of the range track. Approximately two minutes remaining in the boost phase of flight. Chamber pressures continuing to look good on all three boosters. Port and starboard booster in the full thrust mode. Core booster continuing in the partial thrust mode. And standing by for a strap-on booster throttle down momentarily. Port and starboard boosters have begun to throttle down, and we have jettison of both strap-on boosters. The launch had been delayed by a day due to a helium pressurization anomaly during the final minute of the countdown. The Delta IV Heavy uses three Delta IV core stages mounted side by side. The center core is equipped with both second and third upper stages, needed because it takes 55 times more launch energy to reach the sun than it does to go to somewhere relatively closer, like Mars. Glenn Nagel from NASA's Deep Space Communications Complex near Canberra says the Australian tracking station made first contact with the probe as it skimmed around the Earth and accelerated towards its planned first rendezvous with Venus slated for October. So on NASA's second attempt, the Parker Solar Probe was launched on Sunday evening, our local time, and our tracking station here in Canberra was the first anticipation to have contact with it as it came up over our part of the world. It an outward journey to go and touch the sun. Just flew around the Earth and then headed straight out. Yeah, actually heading a, a sort of against the Earth's rotation in a way, which is not the normal way they do it. Came up over our western horizon on its uh, third stage booster separated. That's when we picked it up on our tracking station and then it just literally headed straight on out for a rendezvous with Venus in September and a close approach to the sun about 24 million kilometres away on November 1st. We got some phone calls from listeners who reported seeing lights in the sky. Yes, so we have also been contacted by a few people who are out there looking at the Parker Solar Probe third stage booster passing over our way and we're sort of seeing pretty much across half of the eastern seaboard a sort of a glowing fuzzy cloud of light. Even some wonderful photographs that I've seen of it this morning. The next step, as you said, will be Venus. Our first of seven encounters with Venus. Using Venus as a, a sort of handbrake turn to help the thing slow down down and, and refine its trajectory for its journey to the sun. Yeah, so using Venus's gravity, the spacecraft will then head around for a close encounter with the sun. It will do the seven flybys of Venus looping around the same time, 24 encounters with the sun, culminating with the closest encounters happening after December 2024 
closest approach being December 19th of 2024, uh, approaching within 6 million kilometres of the sun and solar surface. That's Glenn Nagel from NASA's Deep Space Communications Complex near Canberra. During the first week of its journey, the spacecraft will deploy its high-gain antenna and magnetometer boom. It will also deploy the first of a two-part deployment of its electric field antennas. Instrument testing will begin in early September and last approximately four weeks. The Parker Solar Probe seven-year mission will perform the closest ever observations of a star when it travels through the Sun's atmosphere, the corona. The 635 kilogram car sized probe will rely on measurements and imaging to revolutionise science's understanding of the corona as well as the Sun Earth connection. Zooming through space in a highly elliptical orbit, the probe will reach speeds of over 692,000 kilometres an hour, setting the record for the fastest spacecraft in history. It'll take just three months to cover the 150 million kilometres between the Earth and Sun to achieve solar orbit insertion. The spacecraft will then use the gravity of Venus in order to adjust its course and slow down so as to put itself into the best trajectory. In fact, the Parker Solar Probe will fly by Venus seven times throughout the mission, each time getting a little bit closer to the Sun. During its mission, the probe will orbit the Sun 24 times, reaching down to within 6.1 million kilometres of the Sun's visible surface at closest approach. Each orbit will allow scientists to see new regions of the Sun's corona and in turn learn new things about stellar mechanics. Project manager Andy Dreisman from the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory in Laurel, Maryland says the launch was the culmination of six decades of scientific study and millions of hours of effort. The mission will trace the flow of energy that heats the corona and accelerates the solar wind as well as determining the structure and dynamics of the magnetic fields at the source of the solar wind and working out the mechanisms which are accelerating and transporting energetic particles. The $1.5 billion spacecraft carries four scientific instrument suites designed to study magnetic fields, plasma and energetic particles and capture images of the solar wind. The electromagnetic fields investigation, which the scientists simply call fields, will make direct measurements of electric and magnetic fields, radio waves, pointing flux, absolute plasma density and electron temperature. It consists of two flux gate magnetometers, a search coil magnetometer and five plasma volt sensors. The Integrated Science Investigation of the Sun instrument, or ISIS, will measure energetic electrons, protons and heavy ions. It's composed of two independent instruments, simply referred to as EPI High and EPI Low. The Wide Field Imager of Solar Probe, or WISPA for short, is made up of optical telescopes designed to acquire images of the corona and inner heliosphere. And the Solar Wind Electrons, Alphas and Protons, or SWEEP experiment, will count the electrons, protons and helium ions and measure their properties, such as velocity, density and temperature. Its main instruments are two electrostatic analyzers and a Faraday cup. On a mission travelling this close to the Sun, the real challenge will be to keep the spacecraft from burning up. And no, they couldn't just go at night time. NASA's been hoping to send a mission to the solar corona for decades. However, until now, there hasn't been the engineering technology to protect a spacecraft and its instruments from the intense heat. New advances in material sciences have allowed engineers to develop material to fashion a heat shield in front of the spacecraft, not only to withstand the extreme heat of the sun, but also to remain cool on the backside. The heat shield comprises a 12 cm thick carbon composite foam material between two carbon fibre face sheets. While the sun-facing side shimmers at 1370 degrees Celsius, behind the shield the spacecraft will be a more comfortable 30 degrees Celsius. The Parker Solar Probe is also the first NASA mission to be named after a living individual, Dr Eugene Parker, famed solar physicist who back in 1958 first predicted the existence of the solar wind, the stream of charged particles and magnetic fields constantly flowing from the sun, bathing the Earth and solar system. The spacecraft's path through the corona will allow it to observe the acceleration of the very solar wind that Parker predicted, right as it makes its crucial transonic transition. And the corona has another mystery as well. It's where the solar material gets heated to millions of degrees, far hotter than the 6,000 degree surface temperature of the sun. And of course, that's something which has been puzzling physicists for years. After all, normally the further away you are from a heat source, the colder it gets, not hotter. 
the corona is also where some of the most extreme events on the sun occur, such as solar flares and coronal mass ejections, accelerating particles at close to the speed of light. It's these explosions which create space weather events or geomagnetic storms, the solar storms that can pummel the Earth with high-energy particles, endangering astronauts, destroying spacecraft, interfering with navigation and communication systems, and at their worst, disrupting electrical power supplies on the ground. So far, all science's understanding of the corona is based on very remote long-distance sensing. This will be the first time that scientists will be able to see the objects of their study up close and personal. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. Astronomers have discovered a massive inactive galaxy located more than 12.15 billion light years away. The findings reported in the journal Nature date to an epoch when the universe was just 1.65 billion years old, and most galaxies were thought to be low-mass minnows, busily forming stars. However, the study's lead author, Professor Carl Glazebrook from Swinburne University, says this galaxy, named CF Cosmos 2011-5, is a monster. Glazebrook and colleagues found that within a very short period of time, this massive galaxy formed all its stars, three times more than our Milky Way has today, through an extreme starburst event. However, it then stopped forming stars only a billion years after the Big Bang, becoming quiescent, a so-called inactive red and dead galaxy, common in our universe today, but not expected to exist at such an ancient epoch. The galaxy is also extremely compact and dense, with its 300 billion stars crammed into a region of space just 1,500 light-years across. That's about the same distance as from the Sun to the nearby Orion Nebula. Astrophysicists are still debating just how galaxies stop forming stars. Until recently, models suggested that dead galaxies, or red nuggets as they're sometimes called, should only exist from about 3 billion years after the Big Bang, almost twice the age of Cosmos 2011-5. This discovery therefore sets a new record for the earliest massive red galaxy. Glazebrook says it's an incredibly rare find, posing a new challenge to galaxy evolution models in order to accommodate the existence of such galaxies much earlier in the universe. This research builds on earlier research by Swinburne scientists, which suggested that such dead galaxies could exist based on finding dim red objects in extremely deep near-infrared images. For this study, the authors used the world's most powerful optical telescope, the giant 10 meter Keck twins on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. This allowed them to confirm the signatures of these galaxies using the new and unique MOSFIRE spectrograph. They took deep spectra at near infrared wavelengths over two nights to seek out the definitive features, signifying the presence of old stars and a lack of active star formation. The long viewing time was needed to detect the spectral absorption lines, which are very weak compared to the more prominent emission lines generated by star-forming active galaxies. By collecting enough light to measure this galaxy's spectra, Glazebrook and colleagues were able to decipher the cosmic narrative of what stars and elements are present in these galaxies, and therefore construct a timeline of when they form their stars. The observed star formation rate of this galaxy produces just one solar mass star every five years, but at its peak some 700 million years previously, this galaxy would have formed 5,000 times faster. Glazebrook says the huge galaxy formed like a firecracker in less than 100 million years, right at the start of cosmic history. It quickly made a monstrous object and then just as suddenly it quenched and turned itself off. As to why and how it suddenly shut down, well that's still an open question. The simple fact is, there are no modern-day galaxy formation theories to explain such a fast life and death so early in the universe. However, as these early firecrackers are obscured behind a veil of dust, future observations using submillimeter wave telescopes could detect more of them. That's because submillimeter wavelengths are emitted by hot dust which blocks out other light, and so they should tell astronomers when these firecrackers exploded and how big a role they played in developing the primordial universe. With the eventual launch of the James Webb Space Telescope in the next few years, the date keeps changing, astronomers are hoping to build up a large sample of these dead red galaxies due to the high sensitivity of the James Webb's large mirror and the advantage of not peering through any atmosphere in space. For now, Glazebrook says ZF Cosmos 2011-5 remains a mystery. Yeah, this is an interesting story. A couple of years ago we were doing 
some deep images in the infrared and we found this population of galaxies and we had a whole bunch of reasons to think they were really this far away and they were really sort of massive and inactive but of course we needed to go and get some spectra to really prove this and no one really expected to find what we call massive elliptical galaxies so close after the big bang in time it was a bit, bit of a surprise and so it's quite exciting to get the spectrum to confirm that these really did exist and we haven't screwed up it must raise a lot of questions but because this particular galaxy it's huge in terms of the amount of stars it has in it how did something get so big so quickly the universe is about 1.6 billion years old at the time we observed this galaxy and we know it gets we got big pretty quickly just from the ages of the stars in the galaxy but we don't really know how it managed to form so many stars in such a short period of time. In fact, we think it formed all its stars in less than 100 million years, which is quite a, a spectacular event, but we don't really know what physics is driving that early in the universe. Generally, when we model star formation in galaxies, we try to slow it down with processes called feedback. So we don't try to speed it up. So it might need a bit of a little rethink of you know what kind of processes happen in our model. When you looked at this galaxy and, and you realised just how much starburst was going on, what does it tell you about the sort of environment then? This thing's what, it's uh, 1,500 light years across or something? It's a very compact object. Mm. Um, just to give you an idea, 1,500 light years is about distance from the sun to the Orion Nebula, which you can see in the night sky. So imagine the whole galaxy of 300 billion stars packed into that area. You know, if you lived in that galaxy, the sky would be enormously bright with lots of huge red bright stars. It'd be quite spectacular. Yeah, so, I mean, and we don't really know what happens to such galaxies today. We think they may end up in the, the cores of giant elliptical galaxies. It's a typical elliptical galaxy, not much gas, just mostly a lot of um, red stars? Yeah, there's no evidence for a lot of gas in this object, uh, or dust. That's mm. kind of interesting. I mean, maybe it formed so quickly that it blew out all its gas and then that stopped the star formation. How did you find this galaxy? These objects only really are detectable in the near infrared because they're what we call passive galaxies with no star formation, which means that their emission comes out in the optical band but because of the, the very little ultraviolet emission but because of the redshift factor of four where you see it, observe it to come is in the near infrared so you look for objects which are brighter than near infrared faint in the optical and also they have to be faint in the far infrared as well so they have to be peaking in the near infrared and that's because the universe has expanded in the time since the light left these objects yeah that's right so as the light travels across the expanding universe it redshifts and becomes much redder so to really get an idea that these were this kind of galaxy but they're infrared but we needed like 31 bands of optical and infrared data to understand uh, the stellar population and redshift of these galaxies. Is it difficult to take into account things like the reddening of the universe just through the amount of dust between us and the galaxy? Um, there's very little dust in intergalactic space. Reddening comes about from dust within the galaxy. This, this, these galaxies have very little dust. The shape of the light profile with wavelengths tells you that there's very little dust in these objects, so there's very little obscuration. Of course, the whole spectrum is red shifted by the cosmological expansion, um, so most of the light comes out in, in the infrared. But we have a fairly good picture of all those processes. But then we really needed to go and confirm it, and we took an eight-hour-long spectrum, a near-infrared spectrum, using the Keck telescopes in Hawaii, and that spectrum showed presence of absorption line stars which are sort of stars of an age of about 500 million years. So that told us the redshift is correct. That galaxy was relatively old for that period of the universe. Now, at its peak, this galaxy was forming stars something like a thousand times faster than the Milky Way does today. That's right. Pretty impressive. I mean, you know, we get impressed when we hear about galaxies forming stars ten times faster than the Milky Way. Milky Way does about one solar mass star a year. And uh, right now, this galaxy is doing about one solar mass star every five years. But it was doing a lot more than that at its peak. That's right. It has become kind of an extreme starburst, and we don't really know how those can happen in the early universe. They certainly don't really happen today any, anymore. Another question is, can we see such objects at even higher redshift? Perhaps we have. There's been a couple of um, observations from the Atacama millimeter telescope suggesting there may be highly dust-obscured starbursts at redshift 5 and 6. That's such a higher redshift than our galaxy. We don't know how common this process is, though, but there could be a collection there. There's a lot of hope that when the James Webb Space Telescope's launched in 2018, it may just be able to see population three stars, which would even predate this galaxy. Yeah, that's right. So JWST may be able to see a single population three star, which is, if it's very massive in the early universe, which would be interesting. So our galaxy, JWST, would be 
especially interesting because it could get a spectrum a hundred times better in like an hour of observing. And so we actually really understand this sort of stellar content of these galaxies and, and when they formed. So that'll be very hopeful for the future. Looking at the metallicity of something that old will tell you a lot about how stars yeah. evolved early on. Yeah, you'd be able to measure the metallicity and the sort of amount of elements like oxygen and magnesium in these galaxies. And those are useful diagnostics for working out when and how fast the galaxy formed in much more detail than we can currently do. Based on what you've seen in this particular galaxy, what is that telling you about the universe in this particular epoch? Uh, yeah, the universe. So one, one question here is we think galaxies form, well, we're pretty sure galaxies form in, in centres of dark matter halos. I guess your audience is familiar with dark matter, sort of non baryonic material which is supposed to dominate the universe. And the only way we can really form galaxies is to have dark matter conglomerations, dark matter halos as they're called, form first early on and then the regular atoms, the baryons, fall into those halos and form a galaxy. So if you see a massive galaxy like this at Redshift 4, that tells you that there must be quite massive dark matter halos at these redshifts, which uh, it's right at the edge of what's allowed by modern cosmology. So it'll be interesting to try and quantify this better and to see if there is some tension here or not. If there is tension, it could point to some, perhaps, your modifications to the dark matter scenario. That's Professor Carl Glazebrook from Swinburne University in Melbourne. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A new study suggests our solar system may have been shaped by a close encounter with another star billions of years ago. The findings, reported in the Astrophysical Journal, are based on computer simulations designed to explain why the solar system's characteristics suddenly and dramatically change out beyond Neptune. All the known planets in our solar system orbit the Sun on roughly the same plane. However, things get a lot more interesting out beyond Neptune, where the cumulative mass of all the objects there is much smaller than expected, and where these bodies tend to orbit the Sun on mostly inclined and highly eccentric orbits. The study's lead author, Suzanne Faisner from the Max Planck Institute in Germany, says her team simulations suggest that a close flyby of a neighbouring star would have simultaneously led to the observed lower mass density of the outer solar system, while at the same time exciting the bodies there into eccentric inclined orbits and leaving the planets of the inner solar system virtually untouched. Their simulations also suggest that there could be many additional bodies at much higher inclinations out there, still waiting to be discovered, perhaps including the long-postulated Planet X. Our solar system was formed from a collapsing molecular gas and dust cloud about 4.6 billion years ago. In the process, a protoplanetary disk was formed where not only large planets grew, but also smaller objects like asteroids, dwarf planets and moons. Due to the flatness of the disk and our understanding of astrophysics, one would expect that the planets would orbit in a single plane, that is, unless something dramatic happened afterwards. Looking at the solar system right out to the orbit of Neptune, everything seems fine. Most of the planets move on fairly circular orbits, and their orbital inclinations from the ecliptic, or the average orbital plane, vary only slightly. However, things get really messy out beyond Neptune. The biggest puzzle is the dwarf planet Sedna, which moves on a highly inclined, very eccentric orbit, which is so far outside the norm, it couldn't have been scattered there by other planets. And just outside Neptune's orbit, another strange thing happens. The cumulative mass of all the objects dramatically drops by almost three orders of magnitude. And this is happening at approximately the same distance where everything becomes messy. Now, it could all be coincidental, but I don't think so. After all, coincidences like that are rare in nature. Feisner and colleagues believe that what's happened is that a star was approaching the Sun at an early stage in the Sun's development. As it zoomed past, it stole most of the outer material in the Sun's protoplanetary disk and throwing what's left into highly inclined and eccentric orbits. The authors performed thousands of computer simulations to find out exactly what would happen when a star passes very close to our solar system's protoplanetary disk in the process perturbing what would have been a much larger disk. It turns out that the best fit for today's outer solar system comes from a perturbing star which has about the same mass as the Sun or maybe up to 50% lighter, flying past at about three times the distance between the Sun and Neptune. The authors also determined that there would have been a 20 to 30 percent chance of such a flyby occurring during the first billion years of the Sun's life. 
However, the most surprising thing for the researchers about these new studies is that the close flyby hypothesis not only explains the strange orbits of objects in the outer solar system, but also provides a natural explanation for several unexplained features of our solar system, including the mass ratio difference between Neptune and Uranus and the existence of two distinct populations of Kuiper Belt objects. Put simply, the simulations show that a lot of what science currently knows about our outer solar system can be simply explained by a stellar flyby. Of course, the big question now is the likelihood of such an event taking place. Nowadays, such stellar flybys, even hundreds of times more distant, are rare. However, stars like our Sun are typically born in large, densely packed stellar nurseries. These nurseries can contain dozens to hundreds of stars. Therefore, close flybys would have been significantly more common in the distant past. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. The Moon took what looked like a big bite out of the Sun last weekend, providing a partial solar eclipse visible across Asia and around the Arctic Circle. During partial solar eclipses, the Moon never entirely covers the disk of the Sun. The three-hour event on Saturday saw up to 73% of the solar disk covered by the Moon. It follows last month's partial solar eclipse over the southern ocean south of Tasmania, and of course the lunar eclipse seen from most parts of the world two weeks ago. The best viewing for last weekend's partial solar eclipse was above the Arctic Circle. In northern Sweden, near the Norwegian border, 25% of the solar disk was covered at maximum before clouds and rain arrived. And at Yakutsk in northeastern Siberian Russia, 65% of the sun's diameter was covered. The next solar eclipse, another partial, will be on January 6, 2019, and it will be visible across eastern Asia, including Siberian Russia, Japan, eastern China, north and south Korea, as well as southwestern Alaska. If you're listening to the show in Tokyo, you can expect 42% coverage, while in Shanghai, coverage will be around 20%. A total solar eclipse will cross the Pacific in the South American winter on July the 2nd next year, reaching Chile only 13 degrees above the horizon and then extending until sunset near the Argentinian Atlantic coast. An annular eclipse extending from Saudi Arabia and Amman through southern India and Sri Lanka to southern Malaysia and Singapore and onto Guam in the mid-Pacific will occur on December the 26th next year. That'll be followed in 2020 by another annular eclipse. This one with a path of annularity from Alaska through southern Asia to the Pacific on June the 20th. Meanwhile, a total solar eclipse peaking over Argentina, with its path of totality crossing both Chile and Argentina, will occur in the South American summer on December the 14th, 2020. For our American listeners, your next event will occur in the northeast with a partial annular eclipse on June the 10th, 2021. All of Europe in the Middle East will see a partial eclipse on October the 25th, 2022 and almost all of North and South America will see partial phases of an annular eclipse on October 14th, 2023, with the path of annularity passing from the United States down into northern South America. And a total solar eclipse crossing Mexico and the United States from Texas to Maine and onto eastern Canada will take place on April 8th, 2024. For our Australian listeners, the next total eclipse of the Sun will be in 10 years' time. That's on July 22nd, 2028. It'll all start in the Indian Ocean before crossing the Arafura Sea and reaching the North Australian coast near Wyndham and passing just south of Kananara in the Western Australian Kimberleys. It'll then travel across the Northern Territory, passing the Stewart Highway south of Tennant Creek and north of Aileron, crossing southwestern Queensland north of Birdsville, and then into New South Wales at Cameron's Corner before heading through Burke, Dubbo, the Blue Mountains and directly over Sydney. It'll cross the Sydney coastline above the headland between the beaches at South Coogee and Maroubra before heading out into the South Pacific Ocean, across the southern island of New Zealand at Queenstown and ending to the east of the New Zealand mainland. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new low-dose 3-in-1 pill to treat hypertension could transform the way high blood pressure is being treated around the world. The trial, led by the George Institute for Global Health, revealed that 70% of patients reached high blood pressure targets with the triple pill, compared to just over half receiving normal care. 
With high blood pressure being the leading cause of disease burden worldwide, it's expected the findings published in the Journal of the American Medical Association will change guidelines globally. A new study claims both high and low salt intake is linked to an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. The findings, reported in the Lancet Medical Journal, are based on new observational studies in 17 countries involving over 90,000 patients. It found that moderate sodium consumption of between 2 and 5 grams per day resulted in no increased risk. Current guidelines recommend reducing sodium intake to 2 grams per day in order to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease and mortality. However, this has not been achieved in any country and the new study suggests that sodium reduction strategies should instead target countries with communities with very high levels of sodium intake above 5 grams per day rather than a population-wide approach. Scientists have discovered the fossilised remains of an unusually large-bodied so-called nude sea creature from more than half a billion years ago. The creature belonged to an obscure and mysterious group of animals known as chancelleroids, and scientists are unclear about exactly where they fit in the tree of life. They appear to represent a lineage of spiny tube-shaped animals that arose during the Cambrian explosion but then went extinct shortly afterwards. In some ways, they resemble simple filter-feeding animals such as sponges, but many scientists have dismissed those similarities as superficial. The new species, reported in the journal Proceedings of the Royal Society B, were discovered in China's Yunnan province. A new study has found that blue diamonds form up to four times deeper in the Earth's mantle than most other diamonds. Blue diamonds, also known as Type 2B diamonds, are tremendously valuable making them hard to get access to for scientific research purposes. It's also very rare to find one that contains inclusions, which are tiny mineral crystals trapped inside the diamond. Inclusions are remnants of the minerals from the rock in which the diamond crystallised, and they can tell scientists about the conditions under which that diamond was formed. Type 2b diamonds owe their blue colour to the element boron, an element that's usually found on the Earth's surface. But an analysis of trapped mineral grains in 46 blue diamonds examined over two years indicate that they crystallised in rocks that only exist under the extreme pressure and temperature conditions found in Earth's lower mantle. You can read the study in full in the journal Nature. The long-awaited Samsung Galaxy Note 9 has finally been released. Alex Saharov Reut from ITY was there for the unveiling and has all the details. Look, it's an impressive new phone. I mean, visually, it looks very similar to the Note 8. It's not as wide, so it's easier to hold in your hand. It's, I think the screen is a little bit bigger at 6.4 inches. Now, we're going to have a 6.5-inch iPhone, supposedly, in a, in a month or so's time. But this is still going to be Samsung's premium phone with better camera that's got more intelligence in there, even down to being able to tell you if somebody blinked. And so it'll get you to take the photo again right at that appropriate moment. And it also can recognize various scenes, so it's got elements of AI inside. But one of the big things besides things like having 512 gig of storage and 8 gig of RAM in the premium model and 6 gig of RAM and 128 gig in the in the smaller model, it's got this new S Pen. Now the pen is now able to be connected via Bluetooth. And what that means is that you can use the button on there to go forward between slides, push once for a slide, push twice to go back, push once to play in videos, double click to stop. You can hop, press the button down for a period of time and have it bring up an app of your choice. And this adds some intelligence and some smarts into the pen. The pen actually has a charge inside of it lasts for about 30 minutes, takes about 40 seconds to charge. But if the pen's got no charge, it still works as a, as a pen that you can use on the screen to write or draw or do the various things that the S Pen has been able to do. So look, it's got various all sorts of other features inside there, improved Bixby experience, and as I said before, faster processor. It's their premium device, and you can find more about it if you type uh, Samsung Note 9, and you can watch the online keynote. It's an hour long with a Galaxy Home speaker and other bits and pieces inside. Well worth watching the keynotes. That's Alex of royt from IT Wire. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast, iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. Space Times also broadcasts coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter. 
Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 